live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There are a lot of old sayings that you could use to describe what they say about close games that could have gone either way that you think you could have won. You've got the classic saying, close only counts in horseshoes. You've got the could have, should have, would have saying. You've got the, if my grandmother had wheels, should be a bike expression. Whatever expression floats your boat, or whatever expression you want to use, I think there was a certain Rutgers coach that could have used that memo back in the 90s. Because he was about to say something after a game that was so crazy and so delusional that when I saw it for the first time, I couldn't believe those words came out of his mouth. And I'm sure anyone who was reading the papers and opened up the sports section was thinking the same thing. This is Rutgers head coach Doug Graber, and in 1994, he was entering his fifth season with the team. And his fifth season, all things considered, might have been his most infamous, considering how badly he dealt with the press after a pretty bad loss. Because in an effort to say that his team wasn't far off from winning games, and in an effort to say that his team was talented, he wound up saying something so far-fetched that it can only be described as delusional. And this is the story behind Doug Graber and the most delusional moment in the over 150-year history of Rutgers football. Before I talk about the incident and the comments in question, we need some context to understand just who head coach Doug Graber is, and how his team was playing beforehand. Back in 1990, Rutgers hired Graber to try and right the ship. Rutgers football had been struggling pretty heavily. The year before Graber came on board, the team went just 2-7-2 with Dick Anderson as head coach, which was tied for the fewest wins they had in a season since 1936, before World War II ever happened. They hadn't had a winning record since 1987, they hadn't made a bowl game since the Garden State Bowl in 1978, and they had never won a bowl game in program history. It was going to be a tall order and a tall task, to say the least, for Graber to turn around the Scarlet Knights, especially since they were going to be dropping their independent status after the 1990 season to join the Big East. Surely the addition of football won't hurt that conference and its stability in any way whatsoever. And through the first four years of Graber's tenure with the team, Rutgers was struggling pretty heavily. They went just 3-8 in his first season, ending the year by losing 8 of their final 9 games and by being shut out twice while finishing with the 6th worst offense in all of 1A, finishing the season 102nd out of 107 teams. And even though Rutgers had a winning record in the next two seasons, they failed to make a bowl game, and in 1993, ended the season on an embarrassing 5-game losing streak to end the year 4-7 and, and just 1-6 and in Big East play. It seemed like after 4 years, Graber, who was below 500 and won roughly 45% of his games, with that record being significantly worse in conference play, was on the hot seat. But then, the 1994 season got off to an incredible start, because after beating Kent State 28-6 in their season opener, they pulled off one of their biggest upsets in school history by stunning West Virginia 17-12. The Mountaineers were ranked in the preseason top 25, were 11-1 the previous year, were ranked number 3 in the country at one point, and were undefeated before losing to Florida in the Sugar Bowl. And Rutgers, despite trailing the all-time series 16-3, pulled off the upset. Maybe there was legitimate hope for the Scarlet Knights this year. Heck, Graber seemed to think so. As he said after that win, I like this team. I like its character. But now, we were about to find out what this team was made of, and whether they were legitimate or not. And let's just say that over the next three games, the results were not pretty in the slightest bit. Unfortunately, there's no footage of their first game of this three-game stretch against Syracuse. However, Rutgers lost this one 37-36. Rutgers scored a touchdown late in the fourth quarter and elected to go for the win on the two-point conversion, which failed. Up next was a game against number 5-ranked Penn State at State College. Penn State was undefeated entering this game. They had one of the best quarterbacks in the nation in Kerry Collins and had outscored their opponents a whopping 155-38 entering this game for an average of 39 points per game. Those opponents, by the way, were not cupcakes. They were two opponents in the Big Ten and a number 14 ranked USC team. Basically, this is a long way of saying that this game looked like a giant mismatch on paper. And sure enough, it was, as Penn State jumped out to an early 19-0 lead, never trailed or came close to trailing at any point, and prevailed by a final score of 55-27. And now, the Scarlet Knights were going to have to bounce back and try their luck against another ranked opponent, playing Miami in a Big East game on a cold and rainy day in New Jersey. The good news for the Scarlet Knights was that this was the largest crowd in stadium history at the time. The bad news was that Miami entered this game ranked number 13 in the country, and their two games against unranked opponents in 1994 thus far had won by a combined score of 103-10, with one of those wins coming on the road in a cross-country trip to Tempe to take on Arizona State. 
Again, this was another mismatch on paper, and one that Miami was poised to win. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened, as Miami prevailed quite easily, taking a 24-3 in a game where backup quarterback Ryan Collins even got into the game at one point. And in a game where up until garbage time, Miami did not allow Rutgers to cross midfield in the second half. Just like that, any hope that Rutgers had for this 1994 season was gone and shot down. It seemed so promising after a 2-0 start and a win against West Virginia, even if the Mountaineers lost so many names that the win being impressive was simply in school name only. But especially after the Miami game, which was an abomination on the eyes every time Rutgers had the ball, and was a sloppy affair where the Scarlet Knights consistently shot themselves in the foot by committing 13 penalties for well over 100 yards, it was looking like more of the same for Doug Graber and company. And Graber was beginning to get fed up with this notion that his team was not good and was losing games. Granted, he seemed completely in over his head as his seat began to warm up even more, as when asked in the post-game press conference about cleaning up the penalties, he said, I don't have a solution for it. Always a good sign when the head coach of one of the most undisciplined teams in football has no clue how to fix the problem on hand. Especially when, as one writer put it in what might be one of my favorite lines ever written, the referees have thrown enough yellow laundry to clothe Big Bird. However, his comments eventually became borderline delusional and insane, because what he said afterwards was so ridiculous that I'm not sure anyone could genuinely believe it. When that aforementioned article came out that said that Graber couldn't take this program any further, and that it was time for a coaching change, Graber responded by saying, When you lose a couple games in a row, there are going to be articles written. It's automatic. If you people choose to write that, then that's your opinion. Not to be rude, but your opinions don't really matter that much to me, so I'm not going to lose a whole lot of sleep over it. Alright, the fact that he addressed the article and repeated over and over again that he didn't care is a bit of an interesting strategy if you truly don't care. But whatever. That's not the problem most people had with what he said. Because he followed that up by saying, we've played three top 20 teams in a row. Now I'm going to nitpick here, because this statement is not true. Yes, Miami and Penn State were ranked at the time that those games were held, but Syracuse was unranked. In fact, the week after they beat Rutgers, they were still unranked. And during this press conference, Syracuse was not ranked in the top 20, although they were ranked 21st. Maybe Graber misspoke and meant to say top 25 instead of top 20, or he misread the rankings or something. But even though what Graber said was a lie, that's not the problem here. Yes, it's a bad look that you don't pay attention to details, especially when your team is playing so sloppily and your team is a reflection of you, but that's not what the delusional part is. It was what he said next that was truly baffling, because he followed that up by saying, we could have won two of those games. I'm sorry, what? You're telling me you could have won two of those games in that stretch? Uh, were you watching the same football games that we were? Are your eyeballs working? You genuinely believe that you could have won two of those games? Alright, I'll give you Syracuse. That was a one-point game where if the two-point conversion at the end goes your way, you'll walk away from the carrier dome with a victory. I'm not big on the whole we could have won this game because every team can make that argument and we can go in circles all day about it. But whatever. You get that one because one play from a mere two yards out was truly the difference in determining the victor and there were no ifs, ands, or buts about it and no crazy hypotheticals. But you're telling me that you could have beaten either Miami or Penn State? It'd be one thing if Graber said something along the lines of, I believe in our guys, and I believe in the talent on this team, and I believe that if everyone plays at their best and at the level that I know they're capable of playing at, then we can beat any team in the country. That's fine. It'd even be one thing if Graber said that he thinks his team could have won all three of those games, because then I can believe that even though that part was omitted and he never said that, that that's what he meant, and that's what was implied. But to say that you believe you could have won two of those games means that you genuinely believe that you could have and that you should have beaten either Penn State or Miami, and that you were going to lose to the other one no matter what. And the sad part is, quite frankly, I don't know which game is which. I don't know which one you're talking about. Let's start with the Penn State game. Penn State scored eight touchdowns. On seven of their drives, they drove down the field in 90 seconds or less. And on five of those drives, they marched down the field in less than 50 seconds. And Coach Graber, you lost the game by 28 points. You lost by four touchdowns. It was not close. Maybe Graber was talking about this game, but that might not be the case, since Graber immediately said after that Penn State game on the Nittany Lions, they just knocked us off the ball. They're an outstanding offensive football team. So maybe Graber had no belief that his team could win that game, which means that he's talking about the Miami game. And the Miami game is just as bad in an argument. Here were the stats from that game after three quarters. The Hurricanes had roughly double the total yardage that you did. How do those numbers possibly indicate that you had any chance of winning? You didn't cross midfield in the second half until the Hurricanes put in their backup quarterback late in the fourth quarter. 
you committed 13 penalties. Although there were no big plays negated on your end or no big plays that happened on Miami's end because of this, so that's not what you were implying. You lost by 21 points and didn't score a single touchdown. A three-possession game is not close. Everything about this game was a disaster. The most exciting part of the game on your end, I kid you not, was when the stadium fence broke and fans fell on the field. That must be where FedEx Field in Washington got its inspiration from. So let's be very clear, Coach Graber. You're on another planet for saying that you believe that your team could have won two of those three games. Again, I'll give you Syracuse, because I'm feeling generous. But you lost those other two games by a combined 49 points! You lost the games by a combined scoreline of 79-30. to There is not a universe in the world where you guys would have won one of those games. I'm not even sure there's a multiverse dimension where you guys would have won one of those games. And again, it'd be one thing if Graber was implying that if his team plays error-free football and executes the game plan, that they could do this. But that's not what he was implying. Based on the entire context of the press conference, he genuinely watched those two games and said that after either the Penn State game or the Miami game, yeah, we got robbed. We let that one get away from us. We were so close and we almost had him. Maybe next time. That is the definition of a man who is delusional. And that was a very good indicator for how the rest of Graber's tenure with the Scarlet Knights would go. Because as you could probably guess, it was ugly with a capital U. Rutgers finished the 1994 season with a record of 5-5-1, ending the season on a two-game losing streak and once again missing out on a bowl game while finishing with a losing record in conference play. Yes, they tied a ranked Boston College team on the road, so not losing against a top 25 team might count for something, but it was another disappointing season. As a side note, to learn more about Boston College football, click the card in the upper right corner. Still, despite back-to-back -back years without a winning record and no bowl appearances in five years, Graeber came back for season number six with his seat being about as hot as a pavement in Phoenix in the afternoon in the middle of July. And sure enough, he could not keep his job after the 1995 season, as another embarrassing year would end his stint with Rutgers. The team went 4-7, with an abysmal 2-5 record in Big East play, and they had one of the worst defenses in all of college football, allowing 37.5 points per game, which ranked 101st out of 108 teams at the 1A level. They played Penn State and Miami again, and lost to Penn State 59-34 and Miami 56-21. This time, Graber was smart enough to not say how they could have won those games. I think the man's delusional to a certain extent, but he's not that delusional. Graber was fired after 1995, finishing his tenure with a record of 29-36-1, and, and winning just 11 out of 32 games in Big East play. To be fair, he did have coaching success a decade later, when in 2003, he won World Bowl XI as the head coach of the Frankfurt Galaxy in NFL Europe, but he could not do in America what he eventually did in Germany. Look, if you're a head coach, you should have a belief in your team. If you don't believe in the players on your team, you're doing them a massive disservice. The players can pick that up from a mile away, you lose the locker room, and quite frankly, you shouldn't even be there. But at the same time, there's a difference between being optimistic and being delusional. Say after losing by a combined 49 points and after having the fourth quarter for the opposition be a formality where they give the backup some experience and give the starters a time to rest, that you could have won one of those games is absolutely ridiculous. Because if the only way for the Scarlet Knights to have had any chance at winning either of those two games was to have a million White Knights come to their aid, then maybe you need to reevaluate your press conferences and the words you choose to say in them. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.